So the proximal convoluted tubule is uh, the first true section of the nephron tubule. And this is that section where we actually have a lot of microvilli. And those microvilli, we said the point of them was to increase the surface area. So we're looking at this region right over here. So once you filter out of the glomerulus, that filtrate is going to turn into tubular fluid. Simply the name is changing. And it's going to enter this region called the PCT. So from here all the way till right over here. You'll notice you have two sets of arrows. One set of arrows with tubular fluid moving out back into the blood and one set of arrows with solutes moving into tubular fluid. Remember, when you're leaving the tubule, it's called reabsorption. When you're entering the tubule from the blood, it's called secretion. So, because the glomerulus filtered simply based off of size, it filtered a ton of solutes that would eventually go through this tubule and be peed out but you don't want to be peeing out all that solute. That's a lot of good stuff that you want to keep in your body. So what we do is in this first section of the PCT, we're able to reabsorb 65% of all of the filtrate that came out of here. So 65% of whatever we filtered, we're going to reclaim back and reabsorb back into our body because we actually need it. Notice all of these tiny molecules or ions are small enough to get past the fenestrations and filtration slits, but that doesn't mean we want to be urinating them out. So the PCT's job is to reabsorb 65% of the filtrate. Think about that. More than half of what you filtered out needs to be reabsorbed within just this section. So you better hope you have enough surface area to have all the transporters to be able to reabsorb all of that solute. So with all the microvilli, we're able to increase the surface area and include more transporters to get movement of more solutes. Now, not all of these transporters are passive transporters. You do have a lot of active transporters, and that means it's going to require ATP. And what organelle do you know makes ATP? Mitochondria. So we're going to have a good amount of mitochondria in this region as well. So what are a few of the items that get reabsorbed? Well, this is the written version of everything. This is the illustration version. This is the part that I'm going to explain to you. If you want to go over a written portion, this slide is the slide for you. So I'm going to change to a pen. I will let you know that this is one of the more difficult slides that we have. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to go through it very slowly. You should rewind this and rewatch it several times just to make sure you're all on the same page. So the way I'm going to start is going to be in the tubular region. Because we're reabsorbing solutes, that means we're going from tubule out into the blood. That's called reabsorption. So let's look at how we're moving some of our main solutes like glucose from tubular fluid back into the blood, like sodium, like potassium, like chloride. These items that you don't want to be peeing out, you got to be reabsorbing back in. So I'm going to go through these uh, transporters one by one. They each have names. You must know their name and you must know the direction that they move their solutes in. The first one, this guy right over here. This is the sodium glucose symporter. Lucky for you, you already know this one. We've been over this one maybe two or three times in different lectures. The sodium glucose symporter, also known as the SGLT, moves sodium and glucose in the same direction. And if you notice, there's no ATP involved here. Now, which one of these is moving down their concentration gradient? Sodium or glucose? Well, it's going to be sodium. Remember that outside of the cell, it's always higher sodium. Inside of the cell is always lower sodium. So sodium is going to go from a high to a low sodium concentration, means it's going down its gradient. Glucose, however, is already found in high concentrations in the cell. So we can say that glucose is going up its gradient. But the reason it doesn't use ATP 
and you guys already answered this question on a previous exam, is because we're using the downward gradient of sodium to piggyback glucose in. So in this step, or this transporter, you could say, you have officially moved sodium and glucose into the cell. The next transporter is the sodium proton antiporter. So if you were to test your urine acidity, would your urine be more acidic or more basic? Your urine is going to always be acidic, which means it has a high proton concentration. And this is where we're getting that proton concentration. The sodium proton antiporter is able to move sodium down its concentration gradient and piggyback the proton and push it up its concentration gradient. Piggybacking doesn't always need to be in the same direction. It can be in opposite directions like this one here. So the sodium proton antiporter moves sodium into the cell and protons out. Good for us because you don't want to build up protons in your blood or your cell because that'll make you acidic and that is very, very bad for you. The last one is the anion chloride antiporter. We don't specify which anion. Anion just means a negatively charged ion. And we want to move chlorides into the cell because when you move a sodium in and you move a chloride in, that's sodium chloride, typical salt. So chloride moves into the cell. And when you're moving a negative charge into the cell, you have to balance it by moving a negative charge out of the cell. This is called an electrical gradient. You must always maintain electrical gradients in typical non-action potential conducting cells. These cells here, these are cells that just line the tubule. These are not going to conduct action potential. So you have to make sure to keep their voltage at basically negative 70 millivolts. The last one here is called an aquaporin. And the aquaporin is just a pore. It's not a transporter. It's more like a channel. And it only allows for water to pass. And we always know that water follows a high salt concentration. And if you notice, we've moved sodium, sodium, chloride, and glucose all into the cell. So water's going to go ahead and follow that, and that's called osmosis. You have now gone over all of the transporters on the apical side of the cell. The apical side is the side with all these microvilli on them. So once you have all those ions and molecules in the cell, the goal is not to leave them in here. The goal is to push them out of the basolateral membrane of the cell and push them into your blood. So we'll start at the top. This right here, basic glucose transporter. We said there's a lot of glucose in the cell. So it's in a high concentration. Is glucose gonna require ATP to then leave the cell? if you're already at a high concentration in here and a low concentration out here? No, all you need is a transporter because glucose is much too large to simply diffuse out of a membrane of a cell. So we provided a transporter and it doesn't require ATP and it just moves glucose from inside the cell out into the blood. The next one here, this is gonna be the only one that uses ATP. And you notice the ATP gets turned into ADP and a phosphate. This is the typical one that you know, sodium potassium pump. We know that this pump pumps out sodium against the gradient and pumps in potassium again against the gradient. Because they're both moving against the gradient, you have to use ATP. And the last one here is the potassium chloride symporter. You move the sodium out, but hey, you kept building potassium inside. So with that potassium buildup in here, you also want to make sure to balance it. So you don't want to build up too much potassium inside the cell. So you allow the potassium chloride symporter to move them out. This also allows us to use the downward potassium concentration gradient because potassium is moving from high to low concentration to help piggyback the movement of chloride out of the cell. Here's the rule. Wherever sodium goes, chloride is going to follow. Write that down. Again, wherever sodium goes, chloride is going to follow. 
So the potassium moves down its concentration gradient, pulls chloride with it so that they can all three, sodium, potassium, and chloride, enter back into your blood circulation. You have now successfully reabsorbed glucose, sodium, potassium, and chloride from the tubular fluid back into your blood. All of this is written on the previous slide. A few things on this slide. These are minor ions and molecules um, like magnesium, phosphate, and calcium. Make sure to read through those ones, but they are not illustrated on these main transporters. They're going to be found down here. Now, kind of a crazy, crazy fact here. The kidneys will reduce 180 liters of filtrate. Think about how many Coke bottles that is. If each Coke bottle is two liters, 90 Coke bottles is how much fluid your kidneys are filtering in a day. That's insane. And from that 180 liters, through the tubular fluid and the tubule, you're able to reabsorb the majority of it. And we'll talk about how much we're actually going to reabsorb because you're definitely not peeing out 180 liters of fluid a day. Yes, your glomerulus is filtering 180 liters into the tubule, but that tubule reabsorbs about 178 liters so that you're only peeing out one to two liters a day. So you filter 180 into the tubule, but you end up peeing out only one to two liters every day. That's amazing. So two thirds of the water in the filtrate is reabsorbed by the PCT alone. Again, why do we do most reabsorption by the PCT? What is a characteristic inside of the PCT that no other part of the tubule actually has? Keyword here, microvilli. And what do microvilli increase inside of the PCT? Surface area. So again, we reabsorbed sodium, potassium, and chloride. Those are all salts. When you move salts in a certain direction, like from tubule into blood, like here, we move the salts from tubule into blood, who follows the salt movement? Water, right here. Not only do you move water through aquaporins, but you also move it in between the epithelial cells, and that's called solvent drag. You drag the water following the salt. So that water reabsorption is key, but oftentimes it depends on salt movement. So this is going to be a common theme throughout the rest of this PowerPoint, and that theme is this, and write this down. Movement of salt triggers movement of water. Again, movement of salt triggers movement of water. All right, <clears throat> now in the tubule, the PCT, we're not only reabsorbing solutes, but we're also doing some secretion. Now, the two places where you're going to have the most secretion is going to be the PCT and the loop of Henle. We also call that the nephron loop. And remember, secretion is movement of solutes or water from blood back into the tubule. So what would be some points, like main reasons why we would do secretion? Why would you want to move more stuff from blood back into the tubule to be urinated out? Well, the whole point of urinating is to get rid of extra fluids and waste. So waste removal is a big one. If you forgot urea, uric acid, um, anything toxic in your blood and you didn't filter it out, you do have a chance later on to secrete it from the blood vessel back into tubule to get urinated out. So with all of this, we're not only secreting waste, but you can also secrete medications like penicillin and aspirin. 
This is why sometimes the medication tells you to take it three to four times a day because some medications have the ability to be secreted out of your blood and excreted out of the urine a lot faster than others. The second major reason is for acid-base balance. Do you want your blood getting really acidic? No, you don't. And what ion do you know builds up to create acidity? Protons. So if you have too many protons in your blood, those protons are going to secrete out and go into the tubule to get urinated to help regulate the pH of that blood. So secretion is really there to keep your blood clean and healthy and balanced in terms of pH. Now moving on to the nephron loop, also called the loop of Henle. So we went through the glomerulus and filtration. We went through the PCT and reabsorption and secretion. Now we're doing the loop of Henle. Before we start, I want you to notice you have a part of the loop going down. This is called the descending limb. You have part of the loop going up. This is called the ascending limb. The ascending limb has a thin portion and a thick portion. Now, the thin and thick portions, we're not going to differentiate them for the purposes of this class, but we will differentiate between the descending and ascending segments of this. The main purpose of the entire loop of Henle is to balance the salt concentration in the kidney. Do you remember we said, as we move deeper into the medulla of the kidney, we had an increase in salt concentration. So the deeper you go, the saltier we get. This is very important to remember. And we'll talk about why this is so important when we finally get to the collecting duct. You need to make sure you are increasing your salt concentration as you move down into the kidney. So from cortex to medulla. And the loop of Henle does that for us. So primary function is to generate the saline gradient. So from low saline to high saline, that's going to eventually allow this collecting duct to concentrate the urine inside of it. So with that being said, what are the major differences you see between descending loop versus ascending loop? Well, look at what's being reabsorbed. What is the only thing you see being reabsorbed in the descending loop of Henle? Water. That's it. The only thing that's allowed to reabsorb from the descending limb is water. What do you notice is the only thing that's reabsorbed in the ascending limb? Salt. So in the ascending limb, you only have transporters to reabsorb salt. Now the key here is to understand that as you're moving up the ascending limb, really the only difference between thin and thick limb is that the thick limb has more surface area inside of it, which means more salt transporters, which means we're just going to be reabsorbing a higher amount of sodium chloride here than down here. That's it. So again, only water is allowed to reabsorb in the descending loop, and only solute is allowed to reabsorb on the ascending loop. We'll look at this again. Look at the concentration of the tubular fluid. It starts off at a concentration of 300 osmos. As you move down the loop, what is the only thing you're losing out of the tubular fluid? Water. The more water you lose, the more salt that stays behind, the higher the concentration becomes. Once you curve and you turn back, as you move up the loop of Henle, the concentration decreases because the only thing you're reabsorbing now is salts. Now, the mechanism for this is here, and I'm going to 
draw a few things. So here's the lumen. Let me draw a line so we're separating these two illustrations. So the lumen, this is the inside of the tubule, and this is the um, outside of the tubule, so the tissue of the kidney itself. This illustration is a cell that's found in the ascending loop. And remember, the only thing you're moving in the ascending loop is salt. So how do you move salt from the inside of the tubule to the outside of the tubule? Well, you have transporters again. This is a major symporter. It's a really big one, not one that you've learned about yet, but this is the sodium chloride potassium. All three of these ions are going to be moved at the same time. And notice you're not using ATP. You do have sodium moving down its concentration gradient. You also have chloride moving down its concentration gradient. So who piggybacks with them? Potassium. So you move all three salts into the cell. Now, to get these salts out of the cell, you're going to use a potassium channel and a chloride channel. Both of these channels are going to allow the movement of potassium out of the cell and chloride out of the cell. The only way to get the sodium out of the cell is to use the sodium-potassium pump. Now look at this situation here. You're moving the sodium out, but you're getting even more potassium into the cell. At this point, you've built up a huge potassium gradient inside of the cell, which is what allows us to get that potassium freely back out of the cell. This is one of those weird situations where the potassium concentration is a little bit wonky, and that's only because you're pumping such a high concentration of potassium into the cell that it builds up its gradient and it allows it to move out of the cell freely from here and freely from there. So you've successfully moved sodium, potassium, and chloride all from the tubular fluid out into the tissue of the kidney. So we've moved salt from here out to there. So again, the concentration of the salt needs to be from low concentration to a higher and higher concentration down here. So the deeper you go down, the higher the salt concentration is going to be. Another little review illustration is you move down the loop of Henle, the concentration of the tubular fluid increases because you're reabsorbing water. But as you move up the loop of Henle, the concentration of tubular fluid decreases because now you're moving the salt. This is able to create a gradient in the kidney of salt where down in the medulla, it's high salt concentration. And as you make your way up to the cortex, the salt concentration decreases. Again, the importance of this will be um, highlighted when we talk about collecting duct, but just understand that you need to have a very high concentration down in the medulla of the kidney versus higher in the cortex. So the last segment of the uh, tubules are going to be the DCT and the collecting duct. Now this is where we introduce um, different hormones that actually play a role in kidney function and these hormones are going to actually alter how much salt you move which means they're going to alter how much water you move. So in the PCT we reabsorb about 65% of the solute in water. Loop of Henle is going to reabsorb water and salt again. So by the time you get to the DCT, you still have about 20% of the water and 7% of the salts from what you originally filtered out of the glomerulus. Now, if you just peed all this out, it would be about 36 liters a day. So 18 Coke bottles. You are 
definitely not peeing out 18 Coke bottles a day. What would that cause if you ended up peeing out 18 Coke bottles of fluid a day? That would cause major dehydration. You would have a loss of blood volume. And if your blood volume drops, what else is going to drop in your body? Blood pressure. So the DCT and collecting duct, their jobs is to reabsorb more of the water and more of the salts. And these two regions are the two regions that are affected by a few hormones. Aldosterone, ANP, ADH, and parathyroid hormone. This last one we're going to save to talk about during the endocrine lecture. So right now I'm only going to cover these three here. So your job as a student for your next exam is to know the name of the hormone and the physiology of its function. First one, aldosterone. Aldosterone is considered the salt retaining hormone. So when your body makes this hormone, it tells your kidneys to hold in more salt, AKA reabsorb more salt back into your body. And because we talked about this several times, when you reabsorb salt, what else are you going to reabsorb? What follows salt? Water. So here we go. This is the physiology of this, and then we'll talk about how water is related. Aldosterone is a hormone that's secreted by the adrenal cortex, so the cortex of the adrenal gland. And it's secreted when two things happen, either when your blood sodium falls, so your salt concentration in your blood drops, or when the potassium concentration in the blood goes up. Both of these are detrimental and they will both signal the chemoreceptors to eventually send a signal to the adrenal gland to create aldosterone and say, hey, the sodium in the blood is low. Stop peeing it out. So the adrenal gland makes aldosterone. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and tell the kidneys to retain salt. And when we talk about salt, what we're really referring to is sodium and chloride. So the functions of aldosterone, again, to reabsorb sodium and as a byproduct to secrete potassium. So we're going to keep this in. We're going to pee this out. And anywhere sodium goes, who is going to follow? Chloride and water. So the overall movement is that sodium moves back into your blood, which means chloride moves back into your blood and wherever sodium chloride moves water is going to follow so as you reabsorb salt you're reabsorbing more water into your blood if you reabsorb more water into your blood what's going to happen to your blood volume it's going to go up and if your blood volume goes up what's going to happen to your blood pressure blood pressure is also going to go up. And if you're reabsorbing all this water, what do you think is going to happen to your urine output volume? Are you going to be peeing out more fluid or less fluid? Well, urine volume is going to drop down. So all of this happens almost like a domino effect. So the salt concentration in your blood drops that sends a signal to the adrenal gland to make aldosterone. Aldosterone tells the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. If you reabsorb sodium, you reabsorb chloride. And as a result of reabsorbing sodium and chloride, you reabsorb water. The more water you reabsorb, the less water you pee out, so your urine output drops down. The next hormone is ANP. This is kind of a cool one because ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, this is a hormone that's made by your heart. Now the heart's not an endocrine gland, but it does have the ability to make this one hormone. And the heart makes this hormone when the heart feels like the pressure in it is too high. So let's say you have a lot of blood volume. That means a lot of blood 
is getting pumped into your heart, which is causing your heart to stretch. And whenever your heart stretches, because of Starling's law of the heart, it contracts harder, which causes more high pressure blood to shoot out of the aorta, stretching the aorta out. When the aorta stretches, it senses using baroreceptors that, hey, the pressure is too high. So the heart says, okay, no problem. So the heart makes ANP. Atrial natriuretic peptide is a hormone that goes down to the kidneys and says, hey, kidneys, we have way too much blood in our system, which is why the pressure is too high. Do you think you could pee out some of that fluid? And the kidney says, sure, my friend, not a problem. So then the kidneys excrete more salt and whatever follows salt is going to be water. And so you're excreting out more water, which means you're peeing out more water, lowering your blood volume, lowering your blood pressure. Here are a few of the bullet points down here. And um, I'm going to connect a few of these together. So if you recall, and I'm going to draw a glomerulus. This whole drawing thing is getting easier to do on my laptop, which is great. So you have your afferent vessel bringing in blood to the glomerulus, and we'll kind of draw the capillary bed here. And then you have the efferent taking out the blood. Now remember, what's going to help push filtrate out is how much pressure is in here. That little math equation we did last lecture. So what AMP does is it can dilate the afferent arterial, so it makes this bigger, which means more blood gets in, and it's going to constrict the efferent arterial, which means less blood is going to get out. If you open the incoming vessel, but you close the outgoing vessel, what's going to happen to the overall pressure in the glomerulus? Well, it's going to go up. GFR means glomerular filtration rate. So the rate at which you filter out of the glomerulus. So the more pressure that's in here, the more you're going to be pushing fluid out, and that's going to increase filtration out of the glomerulus, eventually creating more fluid down in the tubule, which means you're going to pee out more fluid. Then ANP is also going to inhibit renin and aldosterone. You haven't learned about renin yet, but we will soon. Aldosterone, you just learned about in the previous slide. You're going to inhibit those. And you're going to inhibit ADH. That's one you're going to learn about after this. Because you're inhibiting renin and aldosterone, that directly ties in with this bullet point. If I could have, I would have put these two bullet points together. I'll need to do that for next semester. But renin and aldosterone, both of these called reabsorption of sodium chloride. So if you're inhibiting these, you're going to inhibit reabsorption of sodium chloride. And if you inhibit reabsorption of sodium chloride back into your blood, what else are you going to inhibit the movement of back into your blood? Water. So you stop the movement of water going back into your blood. Overall, ANP causes the kidneys to secrete out more salt, which means excreting out more water, which means more urine output and therefore reduced blood volume and reduced blood pressure. The last one is antidiuretic hormone. It's also called vasopressin, but I will not call it that on your exam. I'm just gonna call it ADH. And ADH is secreted by your brain, specifically the posterior pituitary gland. And the times where this gland secretes ADH are gonna be in response to dehydration or if your blood osmolarity goes up. That means the concentration of the blood went up. You have a lot of salt in your blood or you just have very little water in your blood. Chemoreceptors will sense this in your brain and it'll trigger the posterior pituitary to make ADH. But what is this guy's job? Before we read on it all, ADH means antidiuretic hormone. 
It's a hormone that acts as an anti-diuretic. We're against being a diuretic. What do diuretics normally make you do a lot of? They make you pee a lot. If you're an anti-diuretic, what are you not going to be doing now? You're not going to be peeing a lot. So it's safe to say ADH holds water in. And its exact function is it makes the collecting duct more permeable to water. ADH's job is to go to the collecting duct, which we haven't been over this part just yet. We're going to get to it right now. And tells the collecting duct, hey, I need you to reabsorb more water. And the collecting duct says, sure, as long as I have more of these. Aquaporins. Pores for aqua. Pores of water. These are pores that get inserted into the collecting duct and it allows more water to move. And we'll tie this in once we talk about the collecting duct function, uh, which is in just a moment. Let's do a slight review before we keep piling on. Glomerulus is going to be the first section. This is where you do filtration. The PCT has huge surface area because of the microvilli, which is good because we have to reabsorb all of this back into your body. And then we are able to secrete out more of the drugs and waste back into the tubule. Descending loop of Henle only reabsorbs water. Ascending loop of Henle only reabsorbs salt. And the point of this guy is to create an increasing salt gradient as we go deeper down into the medulla. The distal convoluted tubule we haven't really talked about this guy's function much, and we probably are not going to get very deep into the physio. But this guy does our final balancing act of salts. This guy says, okay, we need a little bit more sodium and chloride back into the blood. All right, let's reabsorb it out. We need some more bicarbonate back into the blood to act as a buffer. Let's move it out. And wherever sodium and chloride goes, who follows? Water. So this guy is our last bit of salt balance before we get into the big one. This final region of the tubule is called the collecting duct. And the collecting duct's main job is to reabsorb high amounts of water. This is where most of our water reabsorption is gonna take place in order to concentrate the urine. This collecting duct has the ability to reabsorb water as we get deeper into the medulla because what concentration increases as you go deeper and deeper into the medulla? We've mentioned this a few times now. The collecting duct um, is the main duct that's going to allow us to conserve water back into our body because what does water always follow? <clears throat> water always follows a high salt concentration. And as we go from cortex down into the medulla of the kidney, what concentration is increasing? The salt concentration. So as you get more salt going deeper into the medulla, you're going to have more reabsorption of that water. So if we just put it as like a depiction here, so my red arrows will be water reabsorption. As you go down, that water reabsorption is higher and higher and higher. Why? Because there's a lot more salt down here than there is up here. And water always follows high salt concentrations. 